Hello, it's Dr. Day Storms, and the second segment from this chapter that we're going to be going over is called the na- or is going to be dealing with the nature of energy, in particular the wave nature of matter. So, what are the goals? The goals here is to discuss the nature of energy and how specific wavelengths, and that electrons can only live in these specific orbitals. Then we're also going to discuss wave nature of matter and how it is scientifically possible to be on the same wavelength as someone or something else. I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek, but what we're going to find out is that matter also distributes wave-like properties. So, if you take a light, like white light, and you shine it through a slit, and it goes through a spectrum, and of course we know that we see like the, the rainbow effect, that whole, that whole um, the electromagnetic spectrum of visible light, the rainbow. However, you can also take an atom like sodium or hydrogen or something, and excite it with energy. And instead of it giving off a spectrum like that, it gives off a very discrete, a very discrete line spectrum. And so we can see here for a sodium lamp that we only see one wavelength given off, but that in this hydrogen, we can actually see discrete bands being given off. So it's not that whole continuous spectrum like what you see in um, a white light or invisible light. So, so Niels Bohr really wanted to start to look into this, and what he did is he adopted Planck's assumption that energy was quantized. And so the first caveat of this is that electrons in an atom can only occupy certain orbits. Okay, and these or- orbits are specific energy levels. Secondly, that electrons are permitted in orbits have specific allowed energies, and these energies are not going to be radiated from the atom. So, for example, we can have an electron here in this first energy level, or an electron in the second energy level, but it's not that this electron here in the second energy level is giving off that energy. And finally, that energy can be absorbed or emitted in such a way that it allows an electron to move from one energy state to another. And that you do this using our friend, the equation that we've seen from the first section, which is energy is equal to Planck's constant times frequency. And so we can actually have an electron in this first energy level absorb a certain amount of energy, and whenever it does, it can go jump up to the second energy level. Or you can have it, if it joins enough energy, jump up to the third energy level. Likewise, if you have an electron in the fourth level, it can actually come down to a different level and give off or emit that energy. And so this leads to the Rydberg equation. And here we can actually measure this energy change. So this change in energy is equal to negative, or the opposite, since it's being given off, um, the Rydberg constant, which if we're using energy, this is the Rydberg constant, 2.18 times 10 to the power of minus 18 joules, times the quantity 1 over nf squared minus 1 over n1, or ni squared, where nf is the final energy level that the electron is on, and ni is the initial energy level that the electron is on. Now, please note... Some books, including the one that you're using right now, it actually, since energy and wavelength are related, you can actually also express the same equation here with 1 over lambda is equal to negative r. The book uses the infinity subscript, but otherwise it's the same. 1 in f squared minus... 1 in i squared. Okay? <clears throat> now, the r infinity here, the Rydberg, uh, Rydberg constant in this instance, has to be in units that are, that are um, used for wavelength. Whereas in the previous one that I have listed, it's in joules, which is an energy unit. And so, if you look it up for um, the constant in terms of inverse meters, the minus r 
infinity oops, is equal to approximately 1.10 times 10 to the 7th inverse meters. So if you're using wavelength, you need to use the second Rydberg constant. If you use energy, you need to use its first one. So let's do a sample problem. What is the change in energy when an electron in the third energy orbital moves to the second energy level? Is energy being absorbed or is it being emitted? Now remember the RH here is 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. You may want to pause the video now and try to work this out on your own. So, how does this work? First you write the equation, of course. Delta E is equal to minus RH times 1 over the N final squared minus 1 over the N initial squared. So what is the N final here? Well, the N final is 2 and the N initial is 3. So when we plug and chug, we get delta E. E is equal to negative 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 times 1 fourth minus 1 ninth. So overall, delta E is negative 3.03 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Since it's a negative sign, that means the system is giving off the energy. Now, if we were going the opposite way, or it's going from the second to the third orbital, then we would have a different sign. It would be a positive 3.03 times 10 to the minus, times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Louis de Broglie, he came next, and he decided, or he realized that that if light can have material properties, like mass, what we've been talking about before, then matter which has mass, should also exhibit wave properties. It comes with the de Broglie wavelength uh, equation. And so here we have lambda, which is the de Broglie wavelength, is equal to Planck's constant, divided by the mass times its velocity. Okay? So, let's look at an example. And so he demonstrated that this, there is this relationship between mass and wavelength. <clears throat> so let's determine what the wavelength of a 100 gram egg is if it's rolling with a constant velocity of 0.1 meters per second. So once again, you may want to pause the video now in order to try to solve this on your own. Okay, so what's the first step? One of the first steps is that you need to convert grams into kilograms, and the reason being is this is one time when joules, the definition of a joule, which one joule is equal to one kilogram times meter squared divided by second squared, is really important. A lot of times people get confused and they try to manipulate and use that as an equation instead of as a unit. But since the mass was given to you in grams and joules requires kilograms, you have to first convert it into kilograms. So 100 grams is equal to 0.1 kilogram. That's the mass of the egg. Now you need to solve for lambda. I do want to point out that joules times seconds would be the same thing as saying kilograms times meters squared divided by second squared times seconds. So that's going to be equal to kilograms times meter squared divided by one second. Okay? All right. So when we do this, you plug and chug. We have 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. And I wrote out the definition 